भारत की कहानी हेलो फ्रेंड्स एज अ पार्ट ऑफ सेलिब्रेटिंग आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव वी रैन अ पॉडकास्ट सीरीज कॉल भारत की कहानी मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी 75 स्टोरीज फॉर 75 डेज रन अप टू इंडिया 75th इंडिपेंडेंस डे नाउ दीज स्टोरीज व्हिच वर अर्लियर अवेलेबल ऑन द वेबसाइट ऑफ आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव Spotify and various other platforms mm. now be available to Namo app virtual meet as Bharat ki kahani Meenakshi Lekhi ki zubani happy listening keep listening and stay tuned to Namo app it's an initiative of Namo app volunteers i thank them all through you Bharat ki kahani Meenakshi Lekhi ki zubani आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्कार टुडे आई ब्रिंग टू यू अनदर स्टोरी फ्रॉम द हिल्स ऑफ नॉर्थ ईस्ट अर्लियर वी लर्न अबाउट द स्टोरी ऑफ रानी गाइडलू टुडे आई ब्रिंग टू यू द स्टोरी ऑफ हाइपू जदोंग विथ होम शी स्टार्टेड द रेवोल्यूशन इन द नॉर्थ ईस्ट जादोंग मालंग माय पॉपुलरली नोन एज हाइपू जादोंग was a popular naga spiritual and political leader who supported and led the cause of independence from imperialism he established hiraka religious movement based on traditional naga religion and fought against the oppression of the colonial rule of the british he was hanged to death by the british in 1931 at the young age of only 26 his cousin rani gairilu succeeded him in his struggle against the british haipu was born on june 10 1905 in poilan village in a family of malangmai clan he was the youngest of three sons and lost his father when he was only a year old his mother who farmed on their ancestral property to make ends meet brought him up haipu's district tamanglong was completely controlled by the british colonial government haipu who had earned a reputation since the age of 10 of his spiritual powers and in interpreting dreams and making prophecies was not entirely pleased to see the spread of british and their allied forces in his area he considered it a threat to the native knowledge and beliefs and did not want them to be lost he was also distressed by the continuous invasions of different powers the british in particular were known for their cruelties they had imposed forced quarter system in the area heavy hill houses taxes and many other laws that left the local people ostracized as soon as haipu became an adult he started talking about popularizing naga culture and urging people to fight for their native prestige and self respect in order to restore naga pride haipu's socio religious hierarcha movement started seeking the abolition of several superstitious beliefs he reduced ritualistic sacrifices and emphasized on practicing truth love and respect of the entire universe haipu's movement started facing opposition from the british while through his movement haipu was trying to bring about changes in his own society there was no denying that the movement was also a political arm that was uniting tribals despite inherent differences to fight against the british Haipu had heard about Gandhi ji's civil disobedience movement and wanted to join forces with him. In January 1927, Haipu heard about Gandhi ji's visit to Silchar and put together a dance group of 200 Naga boys and girls to greet him there. The visit was cancelled for unseen reasons and Haipu felt dejected that he could not meet his idol. While Haipu was a follower of Gandhi, he liked to dress like the British officials in his area, complete with a hat and also rode a pony. In 1928, a British officer, S J Duncan, came across Haipu and seeing him on a pony, asked him to remove his hat and get off the pony. Haipu considered this as an act of subjugation and refused to do so. Duncan, who worked as an SDO, took Haipu to the district headquarters and put him in a jail for a week. 
Haipu's arrest by Duncan came as a boon since it happened just a little before the Naga Club, led by Angami, submitted a representation to the Simon Commission with a request of self-determination for the Nagas. The arrest popularized Haipu even more amongst the tribals and helped him build an army called Rifle. The army had 500 men and women and was trained in military tactics, weapons and intelligence operations. Besides this, the army was trained in agricultural activities and household chose to keep up the facade of being a social group. Once trained, Haipu sent his army to all other tribes in the area, seeking their support against the British, the men and women. In his army would travel as ordinary people singing songs that Haipu had written to create awareness about his cause. Haipu did not gain success with all the tribes in his region, but the Zilia Grongs decided to back him up. Several members of Angamis also decided to lend him their support. At the beginning of 1931, Haipu declared that all taxes for the year should be paid to him and not the British so that he could strengthen his army against the rulers. There were reports of secret meetings and collection of guns too. And based on their information or intelligence gathering through the spies, British were assured that Haipu would wage war against them soon. A month after these reports were confirmed, Haipu was arrested by the British in February 1931 on his way back from Bhuvan Caves with 600 other followers and his cousin Rani Gaidalu. Haipu was sent to Silchar Jail. Haipu's arrest caused unrest in the Naga regions. The British did not expect this kind of an uprising and had to ban people's movements with arms in their hands. Even the native spears and bows and arrows were banned from public spaces and Assam Rifles contingent was led into Haipu's village. The contingent led by J.C. Higgins, the political agent of Manipur, massively destroyed Hirarka temples, arrested elders, looted houses and imposed heavy taxes on people there. Higgins' oppression during this march was particularly brutal because he wanted to make a point. Higgins not just wanted to crush the Naga uprising, but even wanted to strip Haipu of his revered status amongst his people. He decided to bring Haipu from Silcha jail and take him all the way to Imphal. A heavily chained Haipu was handed over to Higgins at Jirighat. On purpose, Higgins took the longest possible route to Imphal, displaying and dragging a chained Haipu to people on the way. The idea was to show them that Haipu had no divine powers and therefore should not be followed or even heard or believed. A month after his arrest, Haipu was lodged in Imphal jail. After long-drawn interrogation when Higgins was not able to extract information from Haipu about his anti-British activities, he decided to falsely implicate him in the murder of four Manipuri traders that had taken place in 1930, while Haipu maintained that the murder had been ordered by the village as a whole. Higgins squared some villagers to testify that Haipu was behind these murders. Even though Haipu was not involved in the decision-making of these murders, on June 13, 1931, he was declared guilty after a trial. On August 29, 1931, he was hanged to death on the banks of a river behind Imphal Jail. His body was later carried to his village and buried there by his cousin Rani Gaidlu who even carried on his mission against the British imperialism. 45 days to go, Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani, Nakshi Lekhi ni Zubani Aazadi ke liye prana huti dene wale pichhattar anam veeron ki pichhattar kahaniya. Meenakshi Lekhi ki Zubani Aap sunenge Amrit Mahutsa portal par एक जून 2022 से रोजाना भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी नमस्कार नमस्ते नमस्कार फ्रेंड्स हेलो 
Today I bring to you a story from the tribal land of Odisha. The tribal resistance movement was an important part of India's freedom struggle, especially in Odisha where a number of tribal leaders supported the cause. Odisha boasts of a large number of tribal resistance movements, but the most inspiring one comes from Koraput, whose hero was none other than Lakshman Nayak. Lakshman Nayak was a tribal civil right activist born in 1899 in Koraput, Odisha. He belonged to Bhumiya tribe. His father, Padlam Nayak, was a tribal chief and a popular leader. He was known for his courage and intelligence. It was for these qualities that the Raja of Jaipur in Koraput appointed him a mustadar. Lakshman was sent to school where he learned reading and writing. He was a nature lover and loved spending time amongst trees, rivers and mountains. With little or no knowledge about the tribals and a general prejudice against them, the British treated the tribals badly and frequently subjected them to torture. While growing up, Lakshman noticed this happening around him and right from his youth he resented the oppression and injustice he saw being inflicted by the British. As he grew older, he started to organize villagers who would oppose the exploitation of the tribals. Fellow tribesmen started to respect Lakshman for his work and soon other members of the freedom struggle noticed him. He was invited to training camps and meetings where he was introduced to national movement. He was particularly impressed by Mahatma Gandhi's principles of truth, non-violence and non-cooperation. He went from door to door of fellow tribals distributing the charkha and spreading the message of non-violence and adult education. This soon changed the rural scenario and established Lakshman as a prominent tribal leader. Lakshman mobilized tribals not just from Koraput but from neighboring areas of Malkangiri and Tentuli Pada too. He promoted Khadi and created awareness about the need for freedom from the British. He organized several development works together with his people, those of construction of roads, bridges and schools. The tribal movement brought the different tribal groups of Koraput together. Lakshman always used non-violent methods to protest. He called for his villagers not to pay tax to the British. His love for the Gandhian way of life was such that people started calling him Gandhi of Malkangiri. When Gandhi called for the Quit India movement in August 1942, the message was circulated across Koraput and other tribal areas. Lakshman gathered tribals from different villages and decided to demonstrate in front of the Mathili police station. On his call, the entire tribal community joined hands. Bonda, Gadabba, Koya, Paraja and Bhumiya tribes. Not just that, even people from non-tribal community, those from Gonda, Pana, Mali and others too joined hands. On 21st August 1942, a long procession was held leading up to Matili police station. By noon, Lakshman reached the police station along with the other demonstrators. The police had prior information that such a demonstration would take place and they had arranged for weapons to manage the crowd in case they got unruly. The demonstrators entered the police station and Lakshman tried to hoist the flag on top of the police station. He was stopped and instead a lati charge was ordered on the demonstrators. Seeing that, Lakshman called for a peaceful protest. So the demonstrators started to chant patriotic slogans. There was jostling because of the lati charge, but the demonstration remained peaceful with none of the demonstrators used any violence against the police. Spotting Lakshman, the police brutally beat him up and threw him in a nearby ditch. They thought this would scare the crowds, but instead it made them angry and they forced their way into the police station out of the fear. The police opened fire on the unarmed gathering. They fired indiscriminately, killing their own forest guard, G Ramaya, who was in the crowd beating the demonstrators as part of the lati charge. 40 people died on the spot and other 200 were injured. But the death of their own guard Ramaya gave police a weapon against Lakshman. They charged Lakshman and 50 others with murder, looting, arson and violence. They were arrested at Mathili police station and sent to Koraput jail. A trial was conducted at the sessions court which found Lakshman guilty. In the judgment, the judge maintained that Lakshman and his accomplices had instigated the crowd to attack the police station charges which Lakshman and others refuted. 
Lakshman was awarded a death sentence. From November 1942 until March 1943, he remained in Behranpur jail. There he continued to spread the message of non-violence, tribal rights and about the freedom struggle amongst fellow prisoners. At the break of dawn on March 29, 1943, at the age of only 44 years, Lakshman was hanged to death. In 1989, a commemorative stamp was issued by the Indian Postal Department on the birth anniversary of Shahid Lakshman Nayak for his work in tribal rights and India's independence. Lakshman remains an Odia folk hero of Koraput and a cult figure among the tribals. He was not just a brave freedom fighter but also a leader of the masses. The role of the tribals in India's freedom struggle will remain a shining example of bravery and resistance. 44 days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani Meenakshi dekhi thi zubani Aazadi ke liye pranahuti dene wale 75 anam veeron ki 75 kahaniyan Meenakshi lekhi ki zubani आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना रोजाना भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते नमस्कार Hello I bring to you another story from the hills of northeast This story is about Leela Nag from Assam long ago when India was yet to gain independence despite some progressive mindsets women found it extremely difficult to be included in the mainstream there were mostly no means of sending girls to school those who managed to go to school dropped out soon after joining on account of an early marriage You'll be surprised in 1947 the literacy rate of India was only about 25%. Forget about the girls even boys did not get educated. Others if lucky made it through school but did not make it to the university. If they did then there were no hostels for women to accommodate them. In that kind of a grim education scenario for women one name stands out Leela Nag or Roy She became the first ever woman in India to graduate from university in India who also fought for women's education to be prioritized and equal rights to be given to them. Leela was a strong young girl who broke barriers and stood out in a sea of accomplished men. Leela was a politician and a reformer and a close associate of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. She was the first woman to be admitted to the Dhaka University. Leela shared her birthday with the father of the nation Mahatma Gandhi. She was born on 2nd October 1900 in an upper middle class family. Her father Rai Bahadur Girish Chandra Nag was a deputy magistrate in Assam. Her mother's name was Kunjalata Nag. Leela Nag's father was the tutor of Subhash Chandra Bose. She did her bachelor's from Bethune College in Calcutta and received a Padmavati gold medal for her brilliant academic performance in english she had to fight her way to get admission in the university of dhaka as only male students were allowed there due to lack of hostel facility her admission to the university was granted with special authorization by the then vice chancellor philip hartog she became the first woman to earn a masters degree from the university of dhaka in 1923 leela nag was a social reformer activist and a politician who carved her own space in the freedom movement after completing her education she devoted herself to social work and girls education she was deeply moved by the poor condition and low status of women in this society she firmly believed that women can only be empowered if they are educated and are financially independent in a move to educate young girls she started a girls school in dhaka Many more schools were established by her which included Nari Shiksha Mandir, Shiksha Bhavan and Shiksha Niketan. She had set up a vocational training center where women were skilled to earn a living. The products made by women were sold at various exhibitions. 
In 1923, she founded Dipali Shongho, where girls were imparted leadership training. Subsequently, Leela started Dipali School, and 12 primary schools where free education was imparted. Focusing on the need of higher education among girls, she opened a women's hostel in Calcutta. She knew that it was important to defend oneself in all situations. for which she trained young girls in martial arts as part of self defense training so that they could protect themselves against all odds to avoid police attention in 1926 leela nag joined the activities carried out by mukti sangh which was later named as shri sangh anil roy was the founder of this organization in 1939 Lila married Anil Chandra Roy another important freedom fighter of his time she was the first female to join the revolutionary organization here women were taught how to make bombs and deal with arms women were assigned the responsibility to distribute confidential material to the revolutionaries and spread information about the work done by the freedom fighters in public confidential British reports confirmed that Leela Nag and her husband Anil were behind the assassination of police commissioner Loman Leela Nag actively participated in the civil disobedience movement launched by Gandhi ji for her role in the freedom struggle she was put behind bars by the British after release from prison in 1937 she joined the nationalist movement Leela Nag started a magazine titled Jashree She had the blessings of Rabindranath Tagore as the name of the magazine was given by him. The magazine was unique because it was driven by women alone. It was the first magazine which was edited by a woman and all the writers of this magazine were also women. In 1941, Leela Nag established Unity Board and National Service Brigade to extend support to those affected during the communal riots in dhaka during the noa khali riots in 1946 she walked 140 kilometers in 6 days and rescued 1307 hindu girls leela nag met gandhi ji and presented the case of the distressed people as he visited the city leela nag had established a relief camp and saved 400 women during the riots during partition when the country faced a gruesome massacre Leela opened several centers in Calcutta to assist the refugees from East Bengal. Leela was the savior of many women who were raped, maimed, and forcibly married off. She was a part of the committee which rescued many women who were being kidnapped and kept forcibly against their wishes. Leela also established the Minority Welfare Central Committee to arrange relief camps for the refugees. She also set up Jatiya Mahila Sangathi in Calcutta to help women financially. When Subhash Chandra Bose was removed from the Congress, Leela Nag joined his forward block. She was sworn in as a member of the Constituent Assembly from Bengal on 9th December 1946. However, she resigned a few months later making her protest against the partition of India. She was a part of the 15 member women committee which drafted the Indian constitution. She was a supporter of women's rights under the Hindu Code Bill, rights of women on property and the independence of the judiciary. Leela Nag died in 1970 after prolonged illness. However, by the time she breathed her last, she had successfully managed to establish women in the mainstream and find them a voice in matters that concern not just women welfare but also nation building. Women emancipation in India owes a great deal to Leela Nag. 43 days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani. Nakshi dekhi ki zubani. Azadi ke liye pranahuti dene wale 75 anam veeron ki 75 kahaniyan. Meenakshi lekhi ki zubani. Aap sunenge Amrit Mahotsav portal par. एक जून 2022 से रोजाना भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां 
Meenakshi Lekhi ki zubaan se Today I bring to you a story from the state of Andhra Pradesh about the brave revolutionary Aluri Sita Ramaraju who was born on 4th of July in the year 1897 some claim it to be 1898 into a Telugu speaking family in the current state of Andhra Pradesh to Venkata Ramaraju who was a professional photographer settled in the town of Rajamandri for his vocation and his mother Surya Narayanamma who was a saintly homemaker many in the village say stories about aluri's father venkata he was a highly free spirited man with immense self respect and had dreamt of a free india aluri grew up hearing stories from his father and also witnessed british atrocities on their tribe one day aluri saw some british officers passing by them while walking suddenly he saluted them He learned it from other Indians as it was a prevalent custom then of Indian people saluting the Europeans acknowledging their superiority over them looking at this furious Venkata scolded young Ramaraju for practicing this he then took Aluri at home and explained the reason of his scolding Venkata told young Aluri about the British officials who had been torturing their tribe for a long time by different ruthless means venkata made aluri witness how the british even levied unbearable taxes on them if any villager was unable to pay them then their family would be tortured looking at this aluri was extremely ashamed at his act and he promised to his father that he would not repeat this again as young aluri turned 8 tragedy struck him as venkata passed away He was deeply shattered and felt helpless. He then decided to follow the path to spirituality. Later when Aluri joined high school, he became a close friend to Madurai Annapurna, who later grew up to be another prominent Indian revolutionary. Madurai and Venkata Rama deeply impacted his life and thoughts that led Aluri to become a patriot. When Aluri attained 15 years of age his reticent and meditative nature made him take up sanyas or monkhood he then moved to his mother's hometown of Vishakhapatnam where he often visited far flung areas in the district and became familiar with the struggles of the tribal people there around this time he met Sita and developed a relationship of love towards her in order to make her memory eternal he then prefixed her name to his and became popularly known as Sita Ramaraju later Aluri developed deep interest in learning languages and privately mastered Telugu, Sanskrit, Hindi and English. He also took a particular interest in astrology, equestrianism, herbalism and palmistry before becoming a monk. He was a versatile personality with a burning flame of revolution against the British in his heart. Aluri Raju was fond of pilgrimage that led him to visit Gangotri and Nasik. which are the birth places of the holy rivers ganga and godavari while he was traveling within the country and he met many revolutionaries in chittagong he was then highly inspired by them during this time the efforts of missionaries to convert the tribal people by any means was gaining momentum this also annoyed him very much and he looked at this as a tool to perpetuate imperialism also on learning upon the socio economic conditions of the hill tribals there he was severely disturbed and decided to build a movement for their independence from the british oppression he continued living an austere life with bare minimum needs amongst the tribals he was loved and accepted by everyone aluri raju started to organize and educate them about their rights he also prepared them for a battle against the tyranny of the forest and revenue officials actions of the missionaries as well as the police the tribals were furious and helpless but this motivation rejuvenated them and made them determined to fight the british when the british authorities started to confiscate the ancestral properties of the tribes the koya tribal brothers named mallam dora and ghantam tora joined the ranks of aluri raju and became his lieutenants rama raju became their leader by choice the british government did try to win him over by offering 60 acres of fertile land to build his ashram 
but the love for his country and people made him rejected and he stood firm by the people soon along with his supporters aluri built a strong and powerful troop of fighters as soon as the british passed the 1882 madras forest act that would restrict the tribals from living there to engaging in agriculture and also stopping them from free movements in the area they used the traditional weaponry like spears and bows and arrows also they learned to employ various tactics like using whistles beating drums to exchange messages amongst themselves the revolutionaries managed to achieve spectacular success initially in their struggle against the british realizing that traditional weaponry would not be of much use against the british for long who were all well equipped with modern firearms he thought the best way forward is to take them away from the enemy and started launching attacks on the police stations where he led a troop of 500 people in the plundering almost on everyday basis that disturbed the british very much the british government announced a bounty on them and later deputed TJ Rutherford who employed extreme methods of violence on people to know the whereabouts of Raju and his followers after putting up a massive effort for nearly 2 years the british finally managed to capture Aluri in the forest of Chintapalle and he was then tied to a tree and executed by shooting on 7th may 1924 in the village of Koyur Later the British government reluctantly and grudgingly acknowledged him as a powerful tactician of the guerrilla warfare which lasted almost 2 years the british also had to spend over 40 lakhs in those days to defeat him one can imagine how the ruthless british wasted nation's money on killing revolutionaries of the nation in raju's honor a tomb was erected in the village of krishna deva pitta near Vishakhapatnam the independent indian government released a postal stamp in his honor at the village of Mogalu Raju was one of those few heroes that could be counted on fingers stated by Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose in 2022 the government of Andhra Pradesh carved out a new district named after him Aluri from the erstwhile Vishakhapatnam district also an indian telugu language film directed by s s rajamouli named as rrr featured a fictional story partly based on aluri sitaram raju's struggle against the british aluri raju was a fearless revolutionary we dedicate the following slogan for his sacrifice dushman ki goliyon ka karenge samna azad hi rahe hain azad rahenge as stated by chandrashekhar azad 42 days to go jai hind jai bharat bharat ki kahani nakshi dekhi thi zubani azadi ke liye pranahuti dene wale 75 anam veeron ki 75 kahaniyan meenakshi lekhi ki zubani aap sunenge amrit mahotsav portal par 1 jun 2022 se rozana आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियाँ मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्कार वनकम लॉन्ग बिफोर रानी लक्ष्मी बाई ऑफ झांसी फॉट अगेंस्ट द ब्रिटिश देर वॉज अनदर क्वीन इन तमिलनाडु by the name of Velu Nachiar who stood up against the East India Company and opposed them bitterly she was perhaps one of the first queens to have fought and won the battle of freedom against the british this happened way back in the 18th century even before the war of 1857 the tamils popularly know her as veera mangai She was the only child of Raja Chelamuthu Vijayaraghunatha Setupati and Rani Skandhi Muthul and was trained in martial arts and the use of weapons to lead their kingdom. Born in 1730 in the kingdom of Ramanathapuram of Tamil Nadu, Velu was trained in language, literature, warfare and administration. 
Other than her own native language, Tamil, she was fluent in Urdu, English, and French. She was trained in the use of weapons and traditional martial art, velary and silambam. She also knew archery, swordsmanship, and horse riding. She was married to the king of Shivaganga, Raja Muthuvada Ganatha Periya Uday Thivar, at the young age of 16. She ruled as the queen of Shivaganga with her husband for two decades until the British, led by their ally Nawab of Arcot, invaded their kingdom and killed the king in Kaliar Coil War. Velu was forced to join the battle, put up a good resistance, but had to flee her kingdom with the help of Marudu brothers to protect herself and her young daughter Velachi. She lived in hiding under the protection of Palayakar Kopala Nayakar, also known as Gopala Nayakar at Virupachi in Dindigul for eight long years. During this time, she gathered an army of soldiers. She also established an army of women whom she personally trained. This was to be the first trained women's army anywhere in the world. She approached Hyder Ali, the Sultan of Mysore, who was not only a powerful ruler but was also fighting against the East India Company. During her meeting, Hyder Ali was so impressed with her command over Urdu and her courage that he invited her to stay at Dindibul Fort. There, she was accorded the respect of her queen. Hyder Ali even built a temple inside his palace as a sign of their friendship. She initially convinced Hyder Ali to help her with modern weapons and 5,000 soldiers. Later, he supported her with more arms and also provided training to Velu's army of soldiers. To raise an army, one needs money, so Velu sought the support of rich merchants and feudal lords. After eight long years in 1780, when she thought that her army was well prepared to not just fight but also win against the British Velu, the warrior queen, a fierce military commander, waged war against the East India Company. To avenge her husband's death, she headed a 5,000-strong army and with the unwavering support of Gopala Nayakar, the Dalit commanders, Murutu brothers and Thandavarayan Pillai, she gave British soldiers a tough time. Her ultimate aim was to take control of the Shivaganga fort in Dindugul, which was still under the control of the British Velu, planned in detail with her commanders to capture the fort. There was information that the British had stored a lot of ammunition in the armory chambers of the fort. Velu knew that her army was ready to fight till their deaths to win back their freedom, but they would not be of any match to the modern weapons which the British had. They had to get rid of the arms of the British by either stealing them to use it themselves, which was a difficult proposition, or destroy their armory. The later seemed like a more doable plan. Now the problem was to find where in the fort were the arms stored. For this, Velu reached out to her commander-in-chief, Kayuli, the brave Dalit soldier. She set out the best spies to find out whereabouts of the arms. Velu's women's army was an excellent at the job and soon found the location of the chambers in the fort. Velu again gave the charge to her confidant, Kayuli, to execute the mission. It was decided that Kayuli, along with the best few women soldiers, would enter the fort in disguise. Once they would reach the chambers, it was planned that the soldiers would pour ghee on Kayuli and she would enter chambers and set herself to fire. Velu was against losing a most trusted warrior, but the plan was so sensitive that they could not trust it to anybody else. Even the accompanying women soldiers were not told about the entire plan. On the day of Vijayadashmi, Velu hugged her confidant and friend Kayuli and bade her goodbye. She then readied herself for the war, which had to follow the blast, while Kayuli fearlessly entered the chambers drenched in ghee and lit the spark on her clothes. Velu charged the fort with her army, cutting through any and every British soldier that came her way. A big blast from atop the fort greeted Velu as she entered the gates of the fort. Velu experienced both happiness and sorrow at the sight of it. Kayuli, perhaps, was the first human bomb in the history of mankind, and her sacrifice did not go waste. Velu not only fought and won the fort against the British and the Nawab of Arcot, but also took back what was rightfully hers, the entire kingdom of Shibganga. Her legendary fight earned her the title of Vira Mangai, the Brave One, Victorious. 
Velu returned to her kingdom along with her daughter and Varuthu brothers as the queen of Shivaganga. She ruled her kingdom for the next 10 years after which she made her daughter Velachi the queen of Shivaganga and gave her the senior administrative positions to the Varuthu brothers. Velu died on 25th December 1796. In 2008, a commemorative stamp was released by the Indian Postal Department in her honour. Former Chief Minister J. J. Lalita inaugurated the Virambangai Velu Nachiar Memorial in Shivaganga in 2014 and erected a six feet tall bronze statue in her memory. Let us celebrate this brave queen in this Amrit Kal and recognize the contribution of these ladies in India's freedom struggle. 41 days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani. आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले 75 अनाम वीरों की 75 कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले 75 अनाम वीरों की 75 कहानियां Meenakshi Lekhi ki zubani. Hello friends, Namaskar, Namaskaram. Today I bring to you a story from the lands of Kurunadu or popularly known as Karnataka. This story is about Kamala Devi who was a freedom fighter, actor, social activist and a feminist. Rarely would you find so many qualities rolled into one but so was Kamala Devi. Many people remember her for reviving Indian handicrafts just as they remember her for promoting dance, drama, art, theatre, music and puppetry. Kamala Devi advocated political and economic equity. She attended the International Alliance of Women at Berlin in 1929. Her idea of feminism and egalitarian politics remains relevant even now. Born on 3rd April 1903 to a Sarswat Brahmin family in Mangalore, she was the fourth and the youngest daughter of Anantaya Dhareshwar, district collector in South Kannada. Kamala Devi's mother was Girirajamma. Her parents were progressive thinkers who took part in the freedom movement of India. Kamala Devi's childhood was marred with tragedy. Kamala Devi's elder sister died in her teens after an early marriage. This tragedy was followed by another one which was more harsh. With Kamala Devi losing her father, Kamala Devi was only 7 years old then as her father left the world without a will. All the property was transferred to his son from his first wife. Girija Amma, the second wife of Anantarya and her children were left in lurch. After her father's death, Kamala Devi was brought up by her mother. After these drastic changes in her personal life, Kamala Devi and her mother shifted home and she started living with her maternal uncle who was a notable social reformer. Kamala Devi received her initial schooling at St. Anne's Convent. The new found home was often visited by political luminaries like Gopal Krishna Gokhale, Sartej Bahadur Sapru, Mahadev Govind Ranade, Srinivas Sastri, Annie Besant and Pandita Ramabai. Kamala Devi's interactions with these eminent personalities sowed seeds of political consciousness in her. However, the deepest impression on Kamala Devi's mind was left by her educated mother and enterprising grandmother. It was from them that she inherited her independent streak and a lifelong love for books. In 1917, 14-year-old Kamala Devi was married but within a year of marriage, her husband died being a liberal-minded person. Kamala Devi's father-in-law encouraged her to pursue studies. Growing up in a land with a rich cultural heritage filled Kamala Devi with a desire to learn the arts and she developed a liking for Yakshagana. After finishing her schooling in Mangalore, Kamala Devi joined the Queen Mary's College in Madras where she found Suhasini Chattopadhyay. Suhasini was the younger sister of Sarojini Naidu. It was through them that she met Hridayanath Chattopadhyay, their elder brother. While Hridayanath was studying in the UK, Kamala Devi went to London to pursue her degree in sociology. Upon her return to India, she joined the freedom movement in 1927 and threw herself into the freedom struggle. 
Politics as a career among women was a rare in those times, but Kamla Devi was born to be a trailblazer. She joined Seva Dal and became the outspoken supporter of Satyagraha. During the Dandi March, she convinced Gandhi ji to give women equal opportunity and to allow them to be in the forefront in salt satyagraha. She was the first woman to be arrested by the British for selling contraband salt. While in jail, she contracted jaundice for treatment. She was admitted in prison hospital. There, she experienced pathetic hospital condition and saw firsthand the awful treatment meted out to the inmates. Once out of jail, she built a hospital for the inmates. One of the most striking images of Kamala Devi was from the Freedom Movement, where she was holding and protecting the flag as a group of satyagrahis tussled with the police. During World War II, she extensively toured United States. There, she met several political activists and sought support for Indian independence by overthrowing the colonial rule. She propounded that civil rights, environmental justice, religious freedom, and political independence were all interrelated, and one cannot be achieved without the other. Kamla Devi even took up the problems of laborers and peasants. When the British got wind of her activism, they banned her from returning to India. Unmoved, Kamla Devi continued her journey and toured South Africa, China, Japan, and Vietnam. The celebration of Indian independence was marred with violence. Post partition, Kamla Devi worked tirelessly, setting up camps in Faridabad where refugees from Northwest Frontier Province were resettled. She built the city of Faridabad to rehabilitate 50,000 craftsmen who moved to India from Pakistan. And guess you'll be surprised that many people who started living in Faridabad and came from Pakistan only recently got their citizenship post amendment in Citizenship Amendment Act. The bonding between Kamla Devi and Hridayanath over art and love for theatre resulted in wedlock. Even though widow remarriage was quite a rare phenomenon in those days, Kamla Devi rebelled against societal constraints. The couple travelled across the country, producing plays and skits. However, their marriage ended over incompatibility. Kamla Devi was the first to get a legal divorce granted through an Indian court of law. Art enthusiasts, Kamla Devi propagated theatre and culture in India. She focused on reviving the handicrafts and textiles. She started some of the first national institutes to archive, protect and promote Indian dance, drama, art, puppetry and music. Kamla Devi promoted sitar, sarangi, bhangra, kathak and chow dance, embroidery, basket weaving and katputli, that is puppetry. Kamla Devi wrote 20 books, many of which were inspired by her personal experiences from visits to foreign countries. She started her film career with first silent film of Kannada, Bridge Katika, in 1931, followed by Tansen, starring K.L. Segal, Shankar Parvati and Dhanna Bhagat. She worked relentlessly for the upliftment of women and pioneered the cooperative movement to help raise the socio-economic status of women. She contributed to the global discourse on feminism, which was unknown at that age and time. For her groundbreaking work in community leadership, she was honoured with Raman Magasay Award in 1966. Kamala Devi played a significant role in the cultural renaissance of the country. She was the first among educated women to appear on public stage and tour with drama troupe all over the world to popularize theatre. She built the National School of Drama, Bhartiya Natya Sangha, Lady Irwin College, Sangeet Natak Academy, Central Cottage Emporium, World Craft Council, Craft Council of India and Delhi Craft Council. She was among the chosen few national leaders who had the privilege of signing the new Constitution of India document. Kamala Devi was the embodiment of women's empowerment. She was an advocate of female sexual freedom and birth control. Her remarriage after widowhood and legal divorce from her second marriage were symbolic of her self-empowerment. A globe-trotting Indian woman of her generation, Kamala Devi was a rarity. Asked by a journalist about her views on women's empowerment, she replied, Let men learn to be equal to women first. Indeed, Kamala Devi's immense travel and experiences shaped her as a scholar, socialist world citizen. She died in Mumbai on 29th October 1988 at the age of 85. Kamala Devi was ahead of her times. 
and remains so even today. She was a woman of substance who showed the path for other women through groundbreaking personal accomplishments. 40 days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani. आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना रोजाना भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते नमस्कार टुडे आई ब्रिंग टू यू अ स्टोरी फ्रॉम द नॉर्थ ईस्टर्न हिल्स ऑफ सिक्किम ओवर द इयर्स वी हैव जस्ट हर्ड अबाउट फ्रीडम फाइटर्स फ्रॉम द अदर पार्ट्स ऑफ आर कंट्री नॉट मच इज नोन अबाउट कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ फ्रीडम फाइटर्स फ्रॉम द नॉर्थ ईस्ट वन सच पर्सनैलिटी इज हेलन लेप्चा later known as Savitri Devi who was one of the most prominent freedom fighters from the hills of Darjeeling and Sikkim born in 1902 in a village near Namchi in South Sikkim she belonged to the indigenous Lepcha tribe with the advent of the railways and English medium boarding schools in Darjeeling it started to develop as an industrial hub more jobs were being created in and around Darjeeling than those available in Sikkim Helen's parents therefore decided to move to Karsiong for better job prospect when Helen was still very young. Helen was the third of seven children of Lepcha family. Helen dropped out of school in 1917 that is when she heard about the Khadi movement or the Khaddar movement and Gandhi's Charkha movement which were being propagated in the hills. Mahatma Gandhi had taken a vow to wear only Khaddar or Khadi the hand spun hand woven fabric of india he decided even to spin the wheel and create his own yarn he called for the people of his country to adopt swadeshi goods including clothes so that the british economy was impacted severely helen got so impressed by the idea that she decided to dedicate her life to the cause of the motherland in 1918 She went off to Calcutta and enrolled herself at the Charkha school which was run by the granddaughter of Pandit Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar. She learned the art of spinning the charkha so quickly and so well that she was sent to represent the training center at the national level exhibition held in Bihar. She went back to Bihar again in 1920. This time volunteering for the relief work in Bihar floods where thousands of people were affected she met Mahatma Gandhi who had come to visit the families Gandhi was so impressed with her dedication that he invited her to his ashram in Sabarmati there he gave her the name of Sabitri Devi that would be the name by which she would be known by for rest of her life seeing her devotion Soon she was given the responsibility to work in parts of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. She worked with coal field laborers and became popular amongst them for her selfless work. Despite her popularity, she led her life in the Gandhian way. She played an important role in the non-cooperation movement. In 1921, she said to have led a protest to over 10,000 coal mine workers from Jharia coal fields today Jharkhand. They were protesting against the exploitation of the tribal workers. The British got perturbed by her mass appeal and declared her activities as unlawful. They issued a warrant in her name and in her pursuit they opened fire at her. Fortunately, she managed to escape unhurt. At this point, she was one of the most wanted leaders on the police list. She went into hiding and lived in Anand Bhavan in Allahabad where she worked closely with several stalwarts of the Indian freedom struggle like Sarojini Naidu, Morarji Desai, Jawaharlal Lal Nehru and many others. She had to however return home due to her mother's illness but that did not deter her from continuing to pursue the freedom struggle. The nationalist movement was making inroads into the hill region. The grievances of the tree plantation workers helped Savitri find a foothold. Back in Kursiong, she gathered volunteers and started a door-to-door campaign against foreign goods in Siliguri while tending to her ailing mother. 
they collected all the foreign goods from houses, made a pile of them and burned them in bonfires. Fearing the spread of nationalism in the hilly terrain, the British imposed curfew to stop Sabitri's campaign, but she remained undeterred and continued her work. She was booked for anti-government activities and arrested in January 1922 along with 12 others. She was imprisoned in Darjeeling Sadar Jail for a period of three months. Upon her release, she was put under house arrest for the next three years. When Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose was kept under house arrest in Kursiong, Sabitri was in constant touch with him through his attendant, who was also from the Lepcha community. She helped in establishing communication through notes between him and his family, hidden in baskets of bread which were sent from her husband's bakery. It is said that she was instrumental in helping Netaji escape from the house arrest in Kursiong and safely reach Kolkata. Savitri also actively participated in the Quit India movement of 1942. She was involved in various social activities to help the downtrodden, especially women. She was popularly known as Helen Didi. In 1932, she was elected as the first woman commissioner of the municipality of Kursiong. She headed a number of organizations like the Sherpa Association and the Lepcha Association. She was honored by the Tribal Welfare Department of West Bengal for her contribution to the welfare of tribals. In 1972, Savitri was given a Tamrapatra along with the Freedom Fighters Pension honoring her contribution to the India's freedom struggle. She died in August 1980, leaving behind a legacy of strong work which continues to inspire women in the hills of Darjeeling and Sikkim. The state conferred the title of Daughter of the Soil for her contributions. In this 75 years of independence, let us remember these valiant personalities from the hinterlands of our country who contributed to our country's freedom struggle and helped us achieve freedom. 39 days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani. आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले 75 अनाम वीरों की 75 कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना भारत की कहानी मीनाक्षी लेखी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले 75 अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियाँ मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी नमस्कार हेलो फ्रेंड्स टुडे आई ब्रिंग टू यू अ स्टोरी फ्रॉम द लैंड व्हिच वाज एट द कोर ऑफ अ फ्रीडम स्ट्रगल दिस इज अ स्टोरी ऑफ मातंगिनी हजारा एन इंडियन रेवोल्यूशनरी हु वाज अ चैंपियन ऑफ द नॉन कोऑपरेशन एंड क्विट इंडिया मूवमेंट बोर्न इनटू अ पुअर फार्मर फैमिली इन अ स्मॉल विलेज near Tamluk in Midnapur district of West Bengal in 1869. She received no formal education. She was a young widow, having been married at the age of 12 and widowed at the age of 18. She joined the Indian freedom struggle at an elderly age and soon became a force to reckon with. For her courage and passion, she was affectionately known as Gandhi Buddhi or Old Lady Gandhi in Bengali. Like Gandhi, she was a frail old person who fought for the freedom of India. After her husband died, Matangini returned to her village and devoted her time to helping the women of her community. Not much is known about her early and midlife or how or when Matangini got involved in the independence movement. But like many women in West Bengal and especially in Midnapur area, Matangini too got interested and involved in independence movement of India when the nationalist movement gained momentum in early 1900s. It is said that the participation of women in the freedom struggle could be the largest from this region. Mahatma Gandhi himself travelled the length and breadth of the country to raise awareness and inspire common people to join the struggle for India's freedom. By 1905, Matingani was actively working in the freedom movement. She became a staunch Gandhian and in 1932 took part in the civil disobedience movement. 
the british introduced a tax on the production of salt which indians opposed as it was a local practice to make our own salt from sea water gandhi led a protest march to dandi to make our own salt matingini joined the movement and took part in the salt making at alinan village her husband's village in bengal since the british considered this illegal they arrested gandhi and many protesters in dandi for breaking the law Here in Bengal too Matingini was arrested for breaking the British salt laws after her release she again protested for the abolition of unjust taxes she was arrested again and this time was imprisoned for 6 months at the Bahrampur jail jail term only strengthened her resolve to participate in the freedom struggle after her release she took to spilling her own khadi not bothered by her failing eyesight she participated in various conferences and protest marches in one such conference in 1933 she was injured in a police baton charge in sirampur later in 1933 when the governor of bengal visited tamluk to address a public gathering matingani sneakily avoided the security ring to reach the dais and wave the black flag at the governor Matingani was at once arrested and imprisoned for another 6 months. There were times when the British saw a frail old woman and punished her to walk long distances. But Matingani continued to serve the country and not only by fighting for its freedom but by also serving its people. When the smallpox epidemic broke out, she dived into nursing the sick. A decade after the civil disobedience movement, the Quit India movement was planned in 1942. Mahatma Gandhi launched it at a mass level throughout the country asking the British to leave India Midnapur joined the movement in a big way the plan was to overthrow the British government and establish an independent Indian state the protesters planned to take over police stations and government offices in Midnapur district women volunteers joined in big numbers Matingini who was 72 years old did not let her age come in the way of participating and leading the protesters she was given the charge of taking over the tamluk police station the british were aware of the plans of the revolutionaries they imposed section 144 in midnapur which prohibited the gathering of four or more people in public matingini gathered over 6000 volunteers mostly women at the outskirts of the town and led the procession towards tamluk police station As the procession reached the criminal court building the police asked the group to disband Matingini stepped forward to appeal to the police not to open fire the british did not listen to her appeal and opened indiscriminate fire at the crowd another story goes that Matingini evading the soldiers broke the cordon and moved forward shouting Lat Saheb go back Lat Saheb go back Either way she continued to advance amongst the firing holding the Indian national flag the police shot her three times badly wounding her in the head and both her hands but Matingani continued chanting vande mataram vande mataram and moving ahead leaving behind the rest of the protesters she died of a bullet wounds holding high the Indian national flag in front of the Tamluk police station the parallel Tamluk government continued to function for another 2 years after matingani's death after which it was disbanded at the request of mahatma gandhi in 1944 post independence many schools roads and housing colonies have been named after matingani hazara she was the first woman revolutionary whose statue was put up in the kolkata maidan in 1977 a statue was also installed at the very spot where she was killed and a cottage was established in her memory in her village in 2015 the shaheed matingini hazara government college for women was established in midnapur district in her name the indian postal department issued a commemorative stamp in 2002 to honor her contribution to the indian freedom struggle matingini's sacrifice went down in history her humble background her love for the motherland her passion to fight at her age and give up her life for the cause of the freedom struggle continues to inspire all of us 38 days to go jai hind jai bharat bharat ki kahani nakshi dekhi ki zubani आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी 
आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना भारत की कहानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानिया मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी वनकम हेलो फ्रेंड्स नमस्ते टुडे आई ब्रिंग टू यूर स्टोरी अबाउट अ यंग बॉय who saw the plight of the weavers community at the hands of the british from up close that is tripur kumaran tripur grew up to be a man who gave up his life for india's independence his dedication to the cause of weavers and india's freedom struggle is unparalleled tripur kumaran was born kumara swami mudaliyar to parents nachimuttu and kharupai in 1904 He was an Indian revolutionary who was popularly known as Thirupur Kumaran as he belonged to the town of Thirupur. Though he was born in Chennimalai, his family moved to a town called Thirupur near Coimbatore when he was still very young. Kumaran completed his primary education in Chennimalai because of his family's financial circumstances. He had to quit school and instead help his father in their traditional handloom weaving work to augment the family income and learn the trade but weaving became a difficult prospect as industrialization by the british became stronger and they were punishing the traditional weavers from india british were producing cotton by collecting cotton from india through machines and they saw india as a big market for their finished product and started flooding it with milk cloth to tackle the home grown weaving industry they stopped money lenders from lending money to the weavers to produce cotton increased the tax on indian cloth and even increased the tax on the export of cotton to countries abroad Weavers and spinners across the country started to lose jobs in thousands. Not to say the least, the fine clothing that they produced was also getting lost. Women were the worst hit. Rural women who were employed in spinning cotton thread for a living found themselves jobless. Many started to migrate to bigger cities for job employment. Some started working as agricultural laborers and some even moved to Africa and South America to work as plantation workers. Kumaran's father too had to migrate to the town of Tripur. Kumaran went with him to look for better jobs to support his family. The plight of the weavers his own personal loss to abandon their village, their home and to move to a city to look for work had a big impact on Kumaran. He learned about Mahatma Gandhi's call to boycott imported textile and instead use traditional hand spun cloth. He was drawn to Gandhian principles as he understood the value of his words and actions. He became an ardent follower of Gandhi and started getting involved in the national movement at an early age. As the freedom struggle was gaining momentum across the country, Kumaran started attending meetings and taking part in protest marches and demonstrations being held in Tripur. He joined the Patriotic Youth Council in Tripur and was a part of the anti-law movement when the agitation spread throughout Tamil Nadu. He got so involved with the independence movement that he also founded the Deshbandhu Youth Association in Tirupur the members were youth from all surrounding areas of Tamil Nadu the association organized numerous protest marches against the british all across the state he was given the name of Tirupur Kumaran as he became a central figure in motivating the youth in joining the freedom movement in january 1932 the british imprisoned mahatma gandhi for leading a demonstration in bombay riots and protests broke out all over the country meetings were held to devise plans to show protest against the british in tirupur too it was decided to organize a protest march against the oppressive british laws and the unlawful arrests of freedom fighters thiyagi sundaram called for a peaceful march in tirupur to protest against the british kumaran organized his youth group to join the protest march against the british on january 10 1932 He led his group singing Bharatiyar song Acha Milai Acha Milai Kumaran and other protesters carried the national flag which was banned by the British when the officers saw the protesters carry the national flag they objected and one officer shouted at Kumaran to put the flag down Kumaran kept holding the flag high and marching ahead this enraged the British and they came down 
heavily on the protesters and started a lati charge. The protesters continued to shout slogans and move forward. A group of guards surrounded Kumaran and started attacking him with lathis, but Kumaran did not leave the premises. They beat him repeatedly. He was badly wounded, but he continued to hold the flag high. One blow of lathi hit his skull and split it. Kumaran cried out, "Vande Mataram!" One last time as he fell down. The flag was still holding up even as his body hit the ground. Same day, Kumaran was admitted to the hospital, where he succumbed to his fatal injuries. Others say that his body was discovered later that day on the streets, still clutching the national flag. He died at the young age of 27 years, fighting for his country, defending the honor of our national flag. He was given the name of Kodi Katta Kumaran, meaning Kumaran, the protector of the national flag. Mahatma Gandhi himself. came to tripur to condole the death of kumaran within a month of his martyrdom the government of tamil nadu set up a memorial with a library and a study to honor his sacrifice the tripur kumaran memorial was established in tripur as a solemn reminder of what this young man had done for our country the government of india issued a commemorative stamp in 2004 to mark the 100th birth anniversary of kumaran The state government declared Kumaran's birthday as a state festival in 2015. Each year school children carrying the national flag march up to the Kumaran memorial to pay tribute. Local residents say they offer mangoes at the memorial of his remembrance. The memorial continues to remain a focal point for all public demonstrations in Tripur. Let us all remember such unsung heroes from our history who played a crucial role in India's freedom struggle. 37 days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani Meenakshi lekhi ki zubani Azadi ke liye pranahuti dene wale 75 anam veeron ki पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना रोजाना भारत की कहानी मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी Hello friends namaskar today i remind you of a story from one of the biggest events in the history of british rule which created an uproar throughout the country which was the partition of bengal in 1905 during the tenure of lord curzon as the british viceroy the plea given by the british was that bengal was spread in a lakh and 89000 square kilometers covering 80 million people It was very difficult to handle it administratively to ensure smooth functioning a division of Bengal into smaller states was chalked up by the british the decision was greatly resented by every indian especially people residing in bengal many considered the partition of bengal an insult they knew it was punishment meted out to the people for participating in the freedom struggle there was a cry for unity where people opposed the partition of bengal Thakur Rabindranath Tagore composed a famous song Ama Shonar Bangla condemning the partition this song later became the national anthem of Bangladesh Kanhaiya Lal Dat a freedom fighter from Bengal was also part of the brigade which opposed the partition of Bengal he was born on 30th august 1888 in chandranagar village of hugli district in west bengal his father chunnilal dat was a government official who served the british and was posted in bombay at the age of 5 kanhaiya lal dat moved to bombay where he received his initial education kanhaiya lal dat was involved in revolutionary activities since his college days the british government kept an eye on people who were associated With any of the revolutionary movements soon they learned about Kanhaiya Lal Dat's revolutionary leanings in order to punish Kanhaiya Lal Dat an instruction was issued to the education board by the british government not to confer the degree for which he had taken the exam so Kanhaiya Lal Dat went back to calcutta so that he could complete his graduation professor charu chandra roy greatly influenced the thinking of young kanhaiya lal dat that 
therefore joined the Yugantar party which was started by Professor Roy. During this period, he also came in touch with other revolutionaries who taught him to use the arms. After completing his graduation, Kanaya Lal Dutt joined the association formed by famous freedom fighter Barindra Kumar. Kanaya Lal resided in the house of Barindra Kumar where weapons and bombs were stored. On 30th April 1908, Kudiram Bose and Prabhul Chakki threw a bomb on carriage thinking that King's Fort, the notorious district magistrate of Muzaffarpur, was seated on it. King's Fort was hated by the people who supported the revolutionaries because he had inflicted a lot of atrocities on the people fighting for the freedom of the country. The bomb blew off, killing the wife and daughter of barrister Pringle Kennedy, who were in the carriage instead of King's Fort. It was a serious offence as a barrister's family was killed in the incident. The British administration left no stone unturned to arrest the people. The British police force nabbed all suspects, which included Narain Goswami, a young boy who was part of the Barindra Kumar Association. Upon threats from the British, Narain revealed all the information available with him and turned an approver. According to the information received from Narain Goswami on 2nd May 1908, Kanaya Lal Dat, Arvind Ghosh, Barindra Kumar were arrested. The revolutionaries were very upset with Narain Goswami and were determined to take revenge. A plan was made to get even with Narain Goswami. A revolver was arranged and now it was time to execute the plan. Both Kanaya Lal Dat and Satyan Bose entered the jail where Narain Goswami was serving his jail term. Soon Kanaya Lal Dutt complained of ill health and was sent to the jail infirmary. Right after Kanaya Lal Dutt was joined by Satyan Bose in the infirmary. As it was planned, Satyan Bose sent a message to Narain Goswami saying he was very unhappy serving the jail term and wanted his help in getting free. He expressed his desire to contact the British officials so that he could pass on some confidential information and turn an approval. Satyan Bose said, since Narain knew the officials well, he wanted a meeting with the British jail authorities. Satyan said he had access to confidential information which he would like to share with Narain. Therefore, he needed one-on-one -on -one meeting. Narain Goswami was excited upon receiving the information. He made an excuse of ailment and entered the infirmary. Upon seeing Narain, both Satyan Bose and Kanhaya Dutt opened fire, killing Narain on the spot. Satyan Bose and Kanhaya Dutt were immediately arrested and tried in court. They were given a death sentence. The decision of the court was final. The court order under that of the accused cannot make an appeal to the higher court against the decision. On 10th November 1908, Kanhaya Lal Dutt gave the extreme sacrifice. He was hanged in Calcutta jail. It is worth noting here that Kanhaya Lal slept well a night before he was taken by the jail authorities for execution. The jail authorities were surprised to note that Kanhaya Lal had gained weight since the time he had heard that he would be hanged for killing Naren Goswami. At the age of 20, Kanaya Lal Dutt made the ultimate sacrifice of laying his life fighting for freedom of the country. We recall the sacrifice of Kanaya Lal Dutt as India celebrates 75 years of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahatsav. 36 days to go. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Bharat ki kahani. आजादी के लिए प्राणाहुति देने वाले पिछहत्तर अनाम वीरों की पिछहत्तर कहानियां मीनाक्षी लेखी की जुबानी आप सुनेंगे अमृत महोत्सव पोर्टल पर 1 जून 2022 से रोजाना